Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Bill Fulton, the director of the Kinder Institute here at Rice. Uh, we're thrilled to have you join us today for this uh, exciting lecture with Tamika Butler. Um, the Kinder Institute, this is the Kinder Institute Forum. Usually we have it here in Houston at the Museum of Fine Arts, uh, but during COVID we are having it online and we're delighted to have you with us. Uh, the Kinder Institute Forum is our premier lecture series uh, bringing urban thought leaders to Houston, either uh, 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 in real time or virtually. Uh, we'll have time for Q&A with the audience in the latter half of the webinar. If you have questions, please ask them in the Q&A box located at the bottom of your screen. Um, uh, and then at about one o'clock Houston time, uh, when Tamika is done, uh, we will go with the Q&A. Uh, you can also increase the likelihood of a particular um, uh, uh, um, of a particular question by liking it, and that'll go to the go to the top. Uh, I want to begin by saying that the, the KI Forum is made possible thanks to our friends at Centerpoint Energy, the title sponsor of this series. And I'd like to ask uh, Tracy Yanda from Centerpoint to, to say a word uh, right now. Tracy, are you there? Yes, I am, Bill. Thank you so much. Hi, everybody. Centerpoint Energy is pleased to welcome everyone to today's KI Forum presentation. We appreciate the Kinder Institute's work to bring nationally known speakers to this audience, which now in this virtual environment has expanded in size and in reach beyond the Houston area. As a reminder of who we are, Centerpoint Energy is an energy delivery company delivering electricity in two urban markets, Houston, Texas and Evansville, Indiana and delivering natural gas to many communities across our eight state service territory, which stretches from the Gulf Coast to the Great Lakes. Our company strives to be a good corporate citizen, and I'm excited to announce the recent release of our 2020 Corporate Responsibility Report. The report focuses on how we deliver responsibility through our commitment to leadership, sustainability, safety, and inclusion. Report highlights include our carbon policy goals, our response to COVID-19, our initiative to remove all cast iron pipes in our gas distribution system by 2023, and our journey to enhance our focus on diversity, diversity and inclusion. I invite you to read the full report on our website at centerpointenergy.com. And finally, today's Veterans Day, and I want to extend our appreciation to veterans and their family members in our communities. Our company has nearly 600 veterans and active reserve service members. Many of them are the employees that you see in your neighborhood installing and maintaining our systems. And they also include many crew members who respond to natural disasters and work to restore electric and gas service in a timely and safe manner. We are proud that they have chosen to work for Centerpoint Energy. And so to these fellow employees and all of the veterans in our communities, we salute you. So thank you for including us in today's agenda and we hope you enjoy the presentation. Thank you, Tracy. Um, generous support also comes for this program from a multi-year grant from Houston Endowment and the Institute relies on other philanthropic investors from other contributors. Special thanks go to Nancy and Rich Kinder and the Kinder Foundation, Laura and Tom Bacon, the Baxter Trust, Chevron, Wells Fargo, the Cullen Trust, Raynad and Stan Merrick, PNC Bank, Catherine and Hank Coleman, Sis and Hasty Johnson, Becky and Ralph O'Connor, Bank of America, Bracewell, HEB, and the United Way of Greater Houston. Thanks to all of you for supporting our programs and this one in particular. Uh, now on with the show, I'd like to introduce Tamika L. Butler. Um, Tamika, you should, if you could um, uh, come on. There she is, uh, unmute yourself. Uh, with her wonderful uh, TLB background there. Uh, Tamika L. Butler has a diverse background in law, community organizing, and nonprofit leadership. She is the principal and founder of Tamika L. Butler Consulting. She's a national expert and speaker on issues related to the built environment, equity, anti-racism, diversity and inclusion, organizational behavior, and change management. Uh, most recently, she was the Director of Planning in California and the Director of Equity and Inclusion at Tool Design. Previously, she served as Executive Director of the Los Angeles Neighborhood Trust and the Executive Director of the Los Angeles Bicycle Coalition. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to today's speaker, Tamika Butler. Thanks so much for being with us today. 
Thanks for having me, Bill, and, and thanks uh, to everybody for tuning in. Uh, as I always say to folks who have seen me before, some of this is going to feel very redundant to you um, because I say the same thing over and over again, and I just feel like we're in a place in our country um, where it's not a matter of being lazy with slides. It's a matter of saying the same thing and, until we, we see change. Um, I also wanna echo uh, what Tracy said and say happy Veterans Day to folks um, or to parents um, who now don't, uh, you know, it's, it's like we always have our kids home now, uh, but it's, it's even harder when there is no programming going on for them. So maybe it's not a great Veterans Day for you, um, but happy Veterans Day to all the vets, including uh, my dad, uh, who instead of going to his normal buffet breakfast this morning, told me he cooked himself uh, a buffet to, to thank himself. Uh, so, so hopefully all the vets out there are doing something uh, to, to enjoy the day. I'm going to share my screen. Uh, we have a lot to get through in the next half hour-ish. Um, and so let's just uh, jump right in. So transportation equity uh, is what I was asked to talk about, um, and and so that's what we're gonna that's what we're gonna hear about. Let me just get all of my screens, my mini screens, uh, in order, so that I'm not distracted. All right. So again, if you've seen me talk before, you know I'd like to give you a little preview so you know exactly uh, what we're in for. We have a lot of slides to get through. Uh, and so I will, I will do what I can to, to get us to, uh, to that 1 p.m. stop. So a little bit about myself. I, I'm a military kid, as, as I've already shared, and I grew up all over the world. Um, but my parents uh, were born and raised uh, in Nebraska. Um, and that's where I went to high school, that's where I went to college, and that's where my dad, who has 14 brothers and sisters, that's where all of my cousins and my family live. Folks are always surprised when I say that. Uh, I think for a couple of reasons, mainly though, because I'm Black and they're always surprised that there are Black people in Nebraska. Um, but Nebraska is an awesome state. Uh, our motto is the good life. And the reason people are always surprised that I'm from there is because when they think of Nebraska, they think of corn and, and not much else. Um, and then in recent weeks, when people thought of, of Nebraska, they thought of uh, folks standing out in the cold. Um, but I'm very happy to say that um, now many people are thinking about specifically Nebraska's second district. Um, which is, again, um, exactly where I grew up in Nebraska, in the Omaha and Bellevue uh, area, where there is the military base, um, and, and where my parents um, all live and, and vote it. Um, and, you know, I, I left Nebraska to go to law school at Stanford. And part of the reason I decided to go to Stanford is because when I left Nebraska, I was like, whew, I, I'm too black, I'm too gay. Um, I don't know if this is a place where I can live. Um, and so I wanted to go to San Francisco um, because for uh, you know, a, a gay kid from the Midwest, when you think about San Francisco, you think about the gay Mecca. Um, because I had never been to California, I didn't realize that Palo Alto and San Francisco were not the same place. Uh, so it was a rude awakening uh, for me, but I enjoyed my law school experience nonetheless, um, enjoyed not having winter even more. And so after law school, I moved to San Francisco. And I moved to San Francisco with a legal fellowship that allowed me for two years to start any project I wanted to start. Um, very grateful to the folks at Skadden who, who have that opportunity. And I decided that I wanted to start a workers' rights clinic in the historically Black neighborhoods of San Francisco. And the reason I decided I wanted to do that is because while I was in law school, my dad, the, the vet, um, was working at a job where he was fired. And when I asked him why and watch, you know, one of my heroes cry, he told me about the discrimination he had experienced. And I thought, you have a daughter who is a lawyer or becoming a lawyer, and you didn't talk to me, you didn't ask me any questions, you signed this paperwork, what were you doing? And just hearing the shame and the guilt in his voice um, for what he had endured, um, despite the fact it wasn't his fault, I thought, well, I want to become an employment lawyer and I want to make sure that there are no folks like my dad who, who never have help. And so I set out to do this 
uh, in San Francisco where the black population was dwindling. I remember moving to San Francisco and feeling like, yo, there are more black folks in, in Nebraska than here. And when I was trying to do um, work around employment law, I kept getting questions about the team uni line. And San Francisco's um, transit agency had just started a new line that went into this historically black neighborhood, Bayview Hunters Point. And the black folks were pissed. Um, they didn't feel like the line was planned with them. They felt like the line was really just to get um, fans of the San Francisco 49ers um, from other parts of the city into Bayview to get to Candlestick Park where they played um, and then take them back out. They didn't think that the stops or the timing were really thought out based on people who lived in the community. And I think that was the first time that I really truly understand the way that transportation is tied to so many of our other social systems, right? Like if you don't have access to quality transportation, then you can't have access to quality jobs. You can't have access to quality healthcare. You can't have access to quality education. And too often um, there are parts of our communities that feel um, segregate it from, um, you know, the core of resources and opportunities, um, and transportation is a huge part of that. I, you know, I practiced law for a few more years before realizing that I was much happy, much happier as a recovering lawyer, and I ultimately ended up as the executive director of the LA County Bicycle Coalition because I just love biking. I love being on my bike and I love feeling free and having that mobility. Um, and, you know, I intentionally don't say I'm a cyclist. I'm not someone who, who strongly identifies with the word cyclist. I have so many identities I, I hold as, as a queer black woman. Um, and frankly, as a Midwesterner, which might be the identity that trumps them all. Um, that for me, it's not about whether or not I'm a cyclist. I'm just a person who loves to ride my bike and loves transportation. And I also love transit. Uh, and I'm on the board of transit um, center, which I also um, always like to disclose because I use a lot of information that transit center puts out there because I think they are one of the organizations putting out a lot of quality um, national transit information, um, not just because I'm on the board, but um, I do like to share that. The other thing I like to always share is this picture of my wife and son. And I, I like to share this picture uh, because I think sometimes when I'm on these webinars or when I'm on a stage, people just have decided that I'm an expert at something. And for me, I'm really just a person. I'm just a person who does this work because I care about my family. And I, I wanna build a world um, that is just better for them. It's the same thing my parents wanted for me. Um, right when my dad was was selling drugs on a corner outside of the projects, um, and no one thought he would he would make it or he would live past a certain age. Um, I think he undoubtedly was was always hoping that I had a better life than him. And I think sometimes we get lost in folks' expertise. But one of the things I love about transportation work is whenever I'm in transportation spaces virtually or, or when we can hopefully get back to being in person, I think a lot of us are people who do this work because we care, because we want to connect people and places and things. Um, and, and we could all have a picture we put up. I think too often we like to say, I'm an engineer, or I'm a planner, or I'm a traffic control, or whatever it is. But, I, you know, I'm just a, a mom and a wife who cares about this work. Uh, I also share this picture um, because our son Ate is, is biracial, um, but, but we are very intentionally raising him as a black man. And, and you know, we had this, this conversation about if we would raise him free of gender and ultimately we decided no, because it would be irresponsible to not prepare him for the world um, you know, that you experience living in a black body um, and the racism and things that you will have to endure. And once we made that decision, my very white wife didn't get to look at me and say, well, you're the black parent, you're gonna handle all of this, right? And for whatever reason, folks who can understand that in a relationship and parenting, don't translate that lesson to work. And so when we're doing equity related work professionally, too often we leave that work to the people of color, to the oppressed and marginalized folks, right? We leave that work to them. And I think often folks who aren't racialized or who aren't folks with disabilities or indigenous folks or queer folks, folks who aren't part of um, 
oppressed groups, they like to convince themselves that they're just sitting back and listening and learning and not taking up space. But there's a fine line between doing that and actually putting that work and labor on the folks who are part of oppressed groups. And so just like in my parenting relationship, we both have a part to play. And when Kelly didn't know things about black hair, when Kelly didn't understand how often black people really do lotion and that we actually don't wash our hair every day, right? All of these things that maybe she didn't know, she had to do that work and she couldn't just rely on me and she couldn't put all of that work on me. And so as we go through this presentation, I would say if you are not part of a press group, how are you constantly thinking about what your role is and how you have to do more than just quietly sit by and listen? I also like to just share a little bit about you know the organization I'm with. I've had a lot of jobs. Like I said, I'm a recovering lawyer, but in July, I opened up my own consulting firm, uh, Tamika L. Butler Consulting. And it's been awesome to be able to do a ton of transportation related work, but also again, I see transportation is this connection to other social issues. And so I'm getting to do a lot of work outside of, of transportation as well. Um, but transportation is still where I found my passion and my love. And for me, you know, transportation is really the space that feels really white, right? No matter how you slice it, when you think of the most common race of, of urban and regional planners, you see that that line for white is really, really high. And it's not just high, right? The orange line, which is urban planners, is higher than the number, you know, that the, the proportion of white people in the United States. So it is disproportionately high how many, um, how many planners are white. And it is disproportionately low um, how many planners are black. And when you look at the other things on this chart, who's not even measured? And it's no different when you look at engineering, right? Like you have, again, an, a, a field in an industry that is predominantly made up of white men. And when you look at other, other groups of folks, it's smaller and smaller. And the fact that other is you know, American Indian, Alaska Natives, Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islanders, we're not, we're not even, like, we're not even counting those people. 1%, um, also known as no one, zero. And, and that's a problem. Because when you look at who's riding transit, right, um, you, you have to understand that transit, in addition to being a great service provider, is a great employer. And when you look at the demographics of transit agencies, it doesn't match what the numbers tell us about who's riding, women, people of color, low income folks. That's not who works there. And it's definitely not who runs the organizations, right? When, when you can look at transit agency CEOs and see that so few of them are women and a majority of the boards are white, right? And that's a problem. And for me, when I think about transportation, I think about it, whether or not you're talking about transit or whether or not you're talking about other aspects of our field. One of the things everyone likes to say and talk about lately is emerging mobility, right? And so when you think about emerging mobility, I like to just say like, well, let's call it what it is. Are these transportation companies or tech companies? And that's where things can also get really problematic because we're mixing an industry in transportation with an industry of technology and both have a white problem, right? They're both white spaces. So when you look at some of these big transportation companies like Uber, you see that they don't have a great representation of women or again, people of color. That line for white folks is really, really long. And it gets worse when you look at the leadership, right? The leadership is even worse when it comes to gender and race. And, you know, it's not just let's pick on Uber. When you think about Lyft, you get the same thing, right? This is white folks, um, the largest group. And again, you go to leadership and it gets even worse. And so whether or not we're talking about transit, whether or not we're talking about technology, or whether or not we're ready to acknowledge it, you know, our educational institutions are a part 
of the problem. And so people will say, you know, well, get your master's degree in planning or go to graduate school. And if you are a person who's part of a racialized group, if you are a person who's part of an oppressed group, you know, um, in some of my presentations when I'm speaking on campuses, I'll just go to the website. I'll go to the Institute website or I'll go to the department website and I'll see how many times I have to scroll before I can get to a diverse person. And then I'll also look at, well, who's in the leadership positions? Who's on the advisory board? Who's a full tenured professor? And who's just a lecturer, right? And those things are often telling. And they're so telling, in fact, that you know, a few years ago, the Kinder Institute had a blog about does urban planning have a race problem? And, you know, urban professors, urban planning professors from across the country um, were, were in Houston. And one of my favorite professors, um, Lisa Bates, at, um, who was at Portland State University, um, said that urban planning had a race problem that it often didn't want to acknowledge, right? There, there was a task force that found that fewer than 10% um, of, of the APA members were racial minorities compared to 30% in the US population, right? And, and so we have to realize that in the space, what we see as, as being normal is really just about who's privileged and who's able to get into these spaces. And so we have to acknowledge that when you want to make a field more diverse, you can go to something like the Planning Accreditation Board and see that again, the folks who are potentially shaping the future of this industry are not reflective of what we might wanna see. And so for me, you know, Professor Bates um, and, and that last slide said that yes, there is an urban planning race problem, but that the profession doesn't wanna talk about it. And my argument is always the only option when we're talking about transportation and planning and moving folks in space and design, the only option is to always talk about race, to always center race in those conversations. But again, the folks who have historically been in power just aren't interested in that option. They are just not. And, and it, it's historically been older, white, cisgender, able-bodied men, right? And I started off by saying part of the reason I'm a recovering lawyer and I love planning is because I see the ways that this profession is such a tool to do amazing work. I see the way that many people who do this work do this work because they care and because they want to help, right? They really, really do. And so often you're in these spaces and you're like, oh my gosh, I found my people. This is amazing. But as soon as you say the only option is to talk about race, people who you used to think were all on the same page are no longer on the same page. And this is more urgent now than ever because we are in a country that is experiencing two crises, right? We are trying to, to figure out what to do when we're being ravaged by both racism and COVID-19. And it literally feels like, especially in this space, like we are in two different worlds where some folks are more concerned with how do we get folks to eat on the sidewalk and, and to open restaurants back up than acknowledging the dignity of, of those of us who might be taking to the streets and saying, just see us as people, right? We're more concerned with the fact that in some localities, winter is coming. And so how can we construct tents for sidewalk dining when in the same breath, we're trying to clear sidewalks of tents for folks experiencing homelessness because we say it's unsightly. Who's unsightly? Who gets to be in a tent? What tents look okay? How many folks say, I love that we're finally taking over public space and setting up restaurants, but not really thinking about what it's like for someone in a wheelchair to now try to get down the sidewalk, which is supposed to be public, right? And none of this is new. This, this idea that we might be in two different Americas isn't new. Black and brown folks have known we've been being hunted and that transportation has been a tool of that. I always like to tell people that, you know, transportation has always been a part of the story of, of Black folks. And, and the, the idea when we're talking about mobility, we're not just talking about an ability to move, we're talking about an ability to stay in place. And so as I sit in Los Angeles on stolen Tongva land, we know that the way that planning has been used to displace and move people to determine who can stay in place and who can't has been a story that has been true since this country was discovered, right? 
And, and again, since my ancestors were put on a boat and enslaved, transportation has been part of the story about how our people have been oppressed. And that's, you know, that's been true. When, when Sister Rosa said, not today, I'm not getting off the bus. And it's true in every aspect of society, whether or not we're talking about incarceration, whether or not we're talking about environmental racism, how our neighborhood zoned, who gets to have oil drilling in their backyard and whose neighborhood isn't that okay in. And people like to say it's about income, but it's not about income because Baldwin Hills, one of the richest black communities in the country is also the site of the largest active oil drilling site. We know that the way our schools are still segregated is a part of this. And everyone in planning, and it seems like in the country, since this has been a New York Times bestseller ever since people are awakening to racial injustices, are learning about redlining, right? The Color of Law, an awesome book that I suggest you read if you haven't read, but we're still doing this work in a white-centered way. The subtitle of this book is A Forgotten History of How Our Government Segregated America. But forgotten to who? Because as a Black person, I haven't forgotten about how our government segregated America. I'm still experiencing it. I haven't forgotten about how my parents can't pass down generational wealth to me because I'm still experiencing it. So even now that we're trying to talk about race, even those folks who are saying, okay, I'll accept this option, they're still doing it from a white centered perspective. And they're saying things like a forgotten history. They're saying things like, we've just never done it this way. It's gonna require a different way of thinking, but different for whom, right? It's still centering whiteness in the norm. And, and Houston doesn't get, you know, they don't get, to slide in this situation, right? Houston is a place that is at an inflection point, right? And, and so we know that local governments are trying to, to, to hold funding for housing recovery and transportation improvements, but we also know that there are disparities in the transit system, right? We know that according to, to Link, um, to Link Houston, an organization which is amazing, more than two thirds of all transit riders and more than 85% of local um, bus riders are black and Latinx people, right? Racism has shaped public transit and it is full of inequities, which one of my colleagues and, and folks who I work with often, Christoph said in, in his Kinder Institute piece. And if you haven't seen the piece or the series, which it was a part of, you should absolutely read it. The reality is when the, the COVID-19 pandemic started, transit agencies had to, had to quickly like, you know, get flexible and figure out what they were gonna do. And Houston Metro was an early leader. They were taking extra precautions for frontline workers um, at hospitals and grocery stores. And they realized the severity of the crisis and made some really prudent decisions on how to improve safety. But like in many places, now, a lot of writers are starting to worry about being stranded, right? Because we know that based on the economy, cuts are coming. And I live in LA, a sprawling metropolis that is very similar to Houston. And we are looking at these cuts that are, again, going to harm folks of color and particularly Black folks more than any others. And this is just a snapshot of my city, but this is something all cities are worried about. And when you think about transit getting cut, you have to acknowledge the affordable housing tie to this. And again, this is, this is something if you haven't read yet, you should absolutely read. I love digging into it as I was preparing for this talk. And sometimes transit agencies like to say, well, these are housing problems. These aren't transportation problems. But as people are continuing to get pushed further and further out just so they can afford to live, they have to have access to jobs, especially as many of these people are transit dependent. And we have to get out of a mindset where there are only certain people who are transit dependent. And so we only have to worry about them because we are all dependent on the people who are transit dependent. So we're all transit dependent. And we do not have enough time to talk about I-45. But, you know, Streets Blog had this headline that said it well, we already know the way that highways have divided our communities and it is continuing to happen again. So I love Houston, I love Beyonce, but these problems aren't just problems that I'm talking about sitting in LA, 
but they're problems that should be hitting home. And they should again be hitting home because we are in a pandemic that is killing black and brown and indigenous folks at a higher rate. You would be hard pressed to talk to black folks, to low income folks, to racialized folks who don't know people who are deeply impacted by the virus who have died, right? I lost a friend who don't know folks who never got to sit behind a Zoom screen and be part of an educational webinar because they have to keep going to work. My mom has never stopped working, right? And you can't ignore that, again, we are in a racial moment where finally some folks are starting to pay attention what, to what many of us have been saying, but I don't need to watch a video of George Floyd gasping for his last breath to know that that green bike lane in the background was not going to save his life. I don't need to have people telling me we're in a pandemic, get out and take a walk, get some fresh air, go on a jog, and know that those aren't realities for certain groups of people in this country. As a bike person, I know tons of white bike people who like to talk and get in cops' faces about how they don't know the law when it comes to bicycling, but I also know that there are Black folks right here in LA where I am who get stopped for bike infractions, but because they're Black, they don't live, right? It's, it's amazing to, to see so many people sign up for a talk for me to speak and to have these conversations with my mom where I'm like, mom, I know you don't know why I love law, but I'm doing okay. I'm successful-ish. Some people know my name, right? But the reality is for many of us black folks, we wonder if we're gonna be recognized for our work, for the quality of what we contribute to the field, or if the only time people will really know our name is when we end up on a list and when we become the next hashtag. And so we log into these webinars and we log into these meetings and we go to class and we go to work and we continue on with our day-to-day -day life. Maybe even our neighbor waves from across the way from a socially distanced appropriate place and says, how are you doing? And it's just a cursory question because everybody's just trying to keep moving. But to be Black in America, to be a racialized person, an oppressed person, a queer person in this world, but particularly in the transportation space, it feels like the seizure warning I should give for this slide, like we're not okay. But it doesn't feel like anyone cares because again, when we try to talk about racism and particularly anti-Blackness in transportation, the folks who have historically held power, those white folks just want us to know that they're not racist. So why do we have to talk about these things? And they don't wanna hear about the privilege of the fact that a lot of the stuff hasn't been a problem to them, and so they didn't think it was a problem. A lot of folks have heard me share the story about my wife, who's French-Canadian, and her best friend, who's, who's Canadian, and they both live here in LA, and we were all sitting around saying, depending on how this election turns out, like, should we move to Canada? And when I was like, why would we move to Canada? This country has always been racist. Like, it doesn't matter what happens. And they said, yeah, but now it's impacting us. And we all laughed. But there are so many folks who are just awakening to what's happening. But why weren't you listening before? Why weren't you listening when we were saying, just stop killing us? And folks often want to know what to do. And, you know, I got like a lot of slides left in this what to do in 10 minutes. Uh, so I'll try to breeze through them. First, just realize that being young, Black, and gifted in this space is not easy, right? And not just this space, but Harvard Business Review did a whole, a whole, whole, whole report on why it is that Black folks are still underrepresented in many organizations no matter what, right? And part of the reason is, is because we've had to figure out the ways of white folks who say they want us to do equity work, right? Transportation equity, but really they don't understand what code switching is. They don't understand that this is something that feels critical for professional advancement for racialized folks or folks who are in oppressed groups, but also takes a huge toll on our mental health. This idea that we have to change the cadence of the way we talk or the things we do or the way we wear our hair and not be different people, but be a little bit less of ourselves, right? And for folks who say they wanna address inclusion and social inequality, they have to start understanding that there are parts of your workforce that believe that they can't be themselves in the office. And frankly, that's why so many organizations stay white. 
because organizational segregation is persistence. Whiteness is still a key credential to moving up. And we have to start getting folks in power to stop thinking about these one-off things that happen that, you know, there was no bad intent, but it just happened. We need to refocus from these narrow concerns about these, these small interactions and really say that, like, no, there are massive inequalities in the way that the workforce is made up and in the labor that we're expecting some people to do. And there have to be psychological resources and support for organizations to redistribute their resources and how they deal with folks of color. We also have to get better at just the terminology we use. Diversity, equity, and inclusion are not the same thing. They are used interchangeably all the same time. This is one of my pet peeves. They are not the same thing. Diversity is just this 90s clip art. Get as many diverse people as possible and get them to the table. Older adults, religious minorities, oh my gosh, a person with a disability, right? Lots of women. If we can do this, we're good, right? But no, we can't get to equity if we only have diversity. We have to also have inclusion. And inclusion, folks who are uncomfortable and who aren't really committed to doing this work like to say that inclusion is everyone feels welcome here. This is 2020, boo. We have to get past that everything. Everyone is welcome here. That is not inclusion. True inclusion requires the shift of power. In addition to getting those pretty exotic faces at the table, are you willing to let those folks have a voice, to have power, to shape budgets, to shape decisions, to influence and mold culture? Because if you're not willing to relinquish some power and shift it, then you can't get to equity. And this is the picture everyone loves for equity because it's easy and it's a good visual. Quality is giving everybody the same thing. Equity is giving folks exactly what they need. And that might mean that some people get nothing at all, right? And it's a fine visual, but I hate it because it doesn't show the reality of where we really start. It doesn't show where we should be trying to get, which is liberation. As I've said, since my ancestors were enslaved, all of my work is about getting free, about feeling liberated, and about being able to move freely to the people, places, and resources I want and need and love, but also to be able to stay in place. But this picture is also fraught because it doesn't tell you about the hidden wall. And the hidden wall is what I've already talked about, power. Who had the power to determine that what I want is to watch a baseball game? What if I hate baseball? Sorry, Houston, what if I think the Astros have ruined the game for me with their cheating, right? What if I want to own a team? What if I want to sell peanuts in the stand? We have to acknowledge that the folks who we say we want to help and serve in doing our transportation work have some autonomy. They have some power. They should be able to self-determine. We have to stop being colonial and saying we want to empower people. That is a colonial mindset that only some of us have power and we have power over people and we can decide who to bestow it upon. We need to start co-powering people. I can say as an individual, I feel empowered, but I don't need other people to empower me. I need them to co-power me and recognize my power. And then we need to start realizing that we can't just say we want our organizations to be more diverse by having more folks of color come in, because if our organizations aren't ready for that diversity, then it's going to be a really horrible experience once those folks get there. Because too often folks want to bring us in, but they only want us there if we remain invisible, right? We like to make these hires and it's a tokenized hire. Everyone feels good. There's this honeymoon period. And let me be clear, white leadership isn't just white people, just like patriarchal, patriarch, patriarch, patriarchy and leadership based in patriarchy isn't just for men. A lot of women to succeed have had to learn that they have to do this thing and act in a way that men would act. And it's the same way with white leadership. A white leadership model is often still carried through by people who aren't white. But we hire folks of color and we have this honeymoon period. And those folks of color, often women of color, often black women, they'll point out some of the issues with the organization. They'll try to make changes. They'll try to do things within the organizational structure, but they just keep getting pushback. And they just keep facing injury and what we call microaggressions that aren't really micro. And then all of a sudden, the organization denies or ignores or blames that person for the things that they are hired to fix. Hey, come be our equity person. Okay, well, to be the equity person, I'm gonna tell you the things you're doing wrong. Well, we're not doing it wrong. You don't understand. You're just having communication issues. It's a bad culture fit. 
you don't know why we're trying to change it. Or we're going to pit people of color against each other. Well, if we have to give these resources to racialized groups, then what are we going to do for women or folks with disabilities? And eventually the retaliation happens and those folks of color leave the organization. Because again, as organizations, if we're not willing to do the internal work, then we can't just do equity because people are going to keep leaving. I only have a little bit of time left and just a few more slides. So I'll take a little bit of extra time, but I do want people to just take a minute and just write down the five people you trust the most in your professional circle. So when you have a job to do or an article to write and you want some feedback or you want some insight or you want some proofreading or you want someone to give you recommendations, who are those folks you reach out to? Who are those folks who you trust when you're like, am I doing this right? Do you have any suggestion? Think about those people and actually write them down. And when you write them down, take a look at your list and think about if those people are pretty similar to you. Who's in your circle of trust? Robin D'Angelo, who wrote the book, White Fragility, she likes to say that from birth to grave, a lot of white folks, folks who aren't in, you know, oppressed groups, they surround themselves with folks who are the same as them. When you think about who delivered you at the hospital, when you think about your wedding party and who showed up, and then when you think about your funeral and who is likely to be invited and speak on your behalf, if all of those folks are just like you or have similar education backgrounds or income or the same race, then how do you actually know if the folks you are trusting are just reinforcing the views you've already had? And as folks of color, we think about this all the time. As a Black person, I'm always like, where are the Black people in the room? I can always count. But for folks who haven't had to think about a lot of the things I'm talking about, you have to acknowledge that it's probably because you have some privilege. And so as I wrap up, I just want to talk about what you should be thinking about as you are on your own personal journey. I'm a transportation person, so I like journeys. When you're doing this work, it is okay to just fake it until you make it, right? You start off as an actor. I'm aging myself with Mel Gibson, but you start off as an actor. Mel Gibson, great actor. Look at those awards. Look at those dashing, twinkling eyes, that great suit, brave heart, and all of that, right? Mel Gibson is a great actor, and sometimes you're just acting. You don't know why you're saying people with disabilities instead of disabled people. You don't know why you're saying people experiencing homelessness instead of homeless. You don't know why you're saying older adults instead of seniors. You don't know why you're using they, them pronouns, right? You don't know why people are starting to do land recognitions. You don't understand it, but people tell you you should do it, so you do it. So you build it into your agenda, you build in the time, you start using these pronouns. And that's okay. Sometimes you're just faking it until you make it. But don't be just an actor. Because at some point, like Mel Gibson, you will be found out. And Mel Gibson's actually a pretty horrible person. You might use anti-Semitic remarks. You might get drunk, get pulled over for DUI and say you hope your pregnant partner gets raped by a gang of N-words, right? You can't just fake it until you make it because at some point, if you don't actually internalize why you're doing the things you're doing, if this work doesn't become personal and important and you're not trying to grow and learn, you will just get stuck at that place of being an actor and you will never be an ally. And once you're an ally, you have to realize that it's not just a noun. It's about doing something. It's about standing up. It's about taking action, right? And then again, I will say, boo, it is 2020 and we have to get beyond the place of just being allies. We need accomplices. And the difference between allies and accomplices is that allies aren't willing to really risk anything. Accomplices are willing to lose something if that's their power, because they understand that for those of us who have to live in these oppressed groups every single day, every time we speak up and speak out and, and speak up for ourselves. As a Black woman, we're always trying to hold it down for everybody. I always say, if there's a natural disaster, find a woman of color and follow her, because we always do what we have to do to take care of others, but at great risk to ourselves, to our mental health, to our professional advancement, to our income. A lot of folks are trying to get on the equity train now, say they're a consultant to do this and that, but a lot of us have been in this world for a minute. We have those resumes that look spotty, where people are like, hmm, why do they leave every few years? We've had to ride home and wonder how we're going to pay the bills because we didn't know what to do except speak up. We're willing to lose something. And if you're not willing to lose something, you might be an ally, 
you might be the person that when a woman speaks up in a meeting and it's cricket, but then a man says the same thing and everyone says it's a good idea, you might send that woman an email and say, hey, I just want you to know, I know you said it first and I'm glad you're on this team. But you won't say it in the meeting because we all know those folks who are often willing to speak out, they're kind of othered. They're kind of the person that's like, oh, Tanika's coming in again. She's going to talk about race. And you don't want to lose anything because we're human and we like to be liked. But true accomplices are willing to speak up in the moment. They're willing to speak up when that person's not even there. They're willing to risk something. And the thing about this journey is it's not some mountaintop that you get to. On some days, you're just an ally. On some issues, you're just an ally. Sometimes you can only fake it until you make it because that's all the energy you have. But you should be trying to move forward because in order to make institutional changes, we need personal changes because only after we have those personal changes will we be able to create these brave spaces. And we're not talking about safe spaces anymore because I never feel safe as a black person in this country. To be my authentic self, I have to be brave every single day. And so how can you create an institution's brave spaces that require vulnerability, that require transparency and honesty, that if you're doing it right are going to mean you make mistakes, but you don't stop yourself from trying just because you don't want to make mistakes, just because you don't want to be called a racist. You make the mistakes, but then you acknowledge it and you move forward and you hold space for atonement. You hold space for the past harms that have been created, particularly by transportation but then you move forward with accountability. And only then can you start to understand the role that power plays and analyze privilege. And to do that, there are a lot of things you can do, but always ask yourself two questions when you're thinking of a new initiative or program or project. Who is this gonna impact most? And were they part of the decision-making process? And if those two answers aren't online, then you know you have a power imbalance. And then you have to start questioning the privilege inherent and who got to be at that decision-making table and why. Whose data did you listen to and why? Why do you listen to the data that comes from an institution, which frankly has barriers of racism that keep certain people out, but you don't listen to the data of the grandmother who sits by her window every day and knows everything about the community. The brother who's hanging out on his stoop who's hanging out on the corner and knows everything. Data is a part of so much of how we do. We love data, right? Data helps answer us questions. It gives us clearer picture. It gives us context to the decisions we're making. But just because it lets us break down impacts on individuals in different populations, we have to ask ourselves what's happening with the data, who's impacted, and, and you know, what are the biases? Not just and who created the data, but who's interpreting the data? How are we ground truthing that data? And how are we being clear about who's represented in the data? You can't just see numbers, you have to see people. And we can't forget that qualitative data it has to be just as respected as quantitative data. And then the last thing I'll say is when we're doing this work, we have to understand that engagement and outreach are not the same thing. Too often in transportation, we like to do outreach, which is just, here's what we're going to do. Put some stickers and tell us what you think. But true engagement is going in, maybe with an idea, maybe with a goal, but knowing that that may change. You're not just going in and saying, we're going to do a bike lane. Put some stickers with where you want it. We're going in and saying, we're going to do a bike lane and hearing, I don't want a bike lane. Well, why don't you want a bike lane? I don't feel safe in the street. I'd rather ride on the sidewalk. Why don't you feel safe in the street? It's engaging. It's doing it in culturally appropriate, linguistically appropriate ways and making sure that you are being participatory, relying on local leadership. And again, being authentic and knowing there's co-power. If, if now is the time for transportation equity, if now is the time to make equity actionable, particularly in the transportation space and in the planning space, we can no longer just go into communities and say, we have a bright idea. And when they say, but what about this? What about my experience as an oppressed person, as a racialized person? We can't just show up and say, well, I'm sorry, I'm just the housing person. I'm just the transportation person. We have to start realizing that for many of us, we live at intersections of different identities. And so there is no such thing as a single issue struggle because we do not lead single issue lives.
And with that, I will wrap it up and say thank you for having me. Thank you, Tamika. Um, I think uh, uh, this is Bill again. Thanks for that very powerful uh, presentation. I think one of the most amazing things that we've seen in the question box is that some uh, talk about co-powering people is that many of the items in the question box are, box are not even questions. They are expressions of how you have connected with them in this talk. So that's never happened before in any, uh, in, in, with any speaker we've had, that's pretty powerful. So I'm gonna just ask a few of the questions, particularly the ones that have a lot of likes. Um, uh, um, and I think a lot of them get to the very things that you've been talking about. Uh, the first question comes from Marky Anderley. Uh, uh, and this is a question that I have uh, encountered a lot as well. I'm a guest lecturer at USC Price. That's the policy school at UCLA. I mean, I'm sorry, at USC in Los Angeles. That was, and I was hired to discuss social justice and transit for graduate students in planning. One of the questions we bump up against a lot in class is, and this is an important one, as I say, I've heard this too. How do new planners who might not have a lot of agency in their first jobs out of grad school push their organizations to move toward justice or more meaningfully engage with marginalized communities? Do you have advice for effective strategies for people, particularly new planners and agencies, when they don't have a lot of decision-making power? Yeah. So I think the first thing is we, you know, something I said before, we all have to recognize that there are ways that we all have power. And I think sometimes we get stuck in feeling powerless and we don't realize how we're powerful. And, and because relationships are dynamic, there are going to be certain relationships where you don't have power and there are going to be certain relationships where you have power over people. So even if you're the entry level planner at a department of transportation, if you try to go to a community and say, I don't have any power, it's frustrating because the community is like, well, you have more power than me. So I think we just have to constantly be thinking about power dynamics. And then, you know, the other thing I always tell to, to new folks in the field is this is a long game, right? Like careers are long. And so you have to you have to think strategically. And, and what I like to say, and folks have heard me say it before, um, this quote, and particularly for folks in oppressed groups, you don't always have to set yourself on fire to keep other people warm. And so sometimes you want to be pushing your, your organization and you wanna be strategic about those opportunities, but sometimes you have to realize that your organization is gonna get everything they're gonna get out of you. And so maybe this isn't the job where you're pushing Maybe this is the job where you're getting skills because you're ultimately going to go to the organization where you're going to push. Now, that's hard because it takes a toll on people. And so I think you have to also come up with a community. Who are the people who are your allies and accomplices? Who can you work with? Who can you be strategic with? And then the last thing I'll say to, to folks is something my therapist once said to me, and I think sometimes doing this work, you, you have to acknowledge that you need support. And sometimes that support is, is therapy. She said, you might change the world, but that doesn't mean that you're going to change this organization. And so I think we also have to constantly be reflective of, is this the right organization for me? Because if I'm having to push this hard, is this the place I want to be? And I still might change the world, but that doesn't mean that it's my responsibility to convince this person that this is valuable. Wow. You know, one of the things that I often wonder is, uh, again, going back to these young agency planners, are there ways that from their position as a junior person in an agency that they can open the door uh, for uh, people in the community to have a voice uh, in these decisions, uh, even if they're not the decision makers themselves, uh, even if decision makers are more senior? Is, is there a way for them to do that? Yeah, I think that's why the inside outside game is so important. And, you know, I've worked with a lot of, when I was a, an advocate, I worked with a lot of junior planners who said, hey, I don't have a ton of power, but what power they did have was access. And so they could work with me as the community-based organization and say, hey, there's this thing coming up on a council meeting. Hey, there's this project we're trying to run and I don't have the power to stop it. However, if we are getting hounded by the community about X, that will change things. And so I think sometimes people think that the only power you can have is in decision-making, but there's a lot of power in 
information and a lot of power and connections and networking. And so sometimes it's just how do you build that coalition even with outside of your organization who can give you the push you need and the cover you need to be able to make change within it. Um, the next question is from Maria Zimmerman. Hello, Maria. Um, I would welcome thoughts you have on how to push back on cities, mayors and police departments and transit agencies that are using transit as a weapon in suppressing racial justice actions, i.e. closing transit in Chicago during protests. And that's not exclusive to Chicago, right? That happens in many places. And even this past weekend during election celebrations, using transit buses to drive post protesters to jail, et cetera. Yeah, and so for me, this is why coalition building is so important. Something I always used to share with people is when I was at the Bike Coalition, I would go to a lot of meetings with a diverse coalition of, of folks, criminal justice folks, housing folks, um, public health folks, where we never talk about bikes. And sometimes I got questions, why are you going to these meetings? How does this help our cause? But then when issues came up, like Metro here in LA, using some of their buses, to, to house protesters and drive them places, then it wasn't just the transit agencies and the, or the transit advocacy groups who spoke up. We had a whole coalition. And we had a whole coalition of folks who had trusted the transportation people because they had been in the room. We have to start realizing that if we want to elevate some of these issues, it's going to take more than just us. And so we just can't go to the criminal justice groups when we want something and say, can you help us with this? We have to start building that coalition well before. And then we can't ignore the power of media and how those sometimes have to be part of our coalitions as well. How did you deal with the race question in the bike coalition? Because that's a, you know, a bicyclists are a very diverse group of people. Some have more power than others. People ride bikes for different reasons. Uh, um, some are more active than others. How, how did you manage that in the LA bike coalition? You know, I think it was something that I said when I first got interviewed, like, yo, I'm black. And so if you hire me, this is going to be a racial justice organization. And so I think part of it is just living as, as I authentically am. I don't have the privilege when I'm riding my bike to, to not see race. And part of the reason I don't have the privilege to not see race isn't because I don't want to not see race. It's because other people see me, right? Other people treat me in a certain way. And so I, I helped guest edit uh, an issue of Bicycling Magazine that was all about the experience of Black folks on bikes. And I would strongly suggest that folks read that um, because it's a number of stories from folks from Olympic medalists um, to, you know, people in community on their, on their ride talking about how you can't just shut up and bike, how you have to be talking about these issues. And I won't say that it, it was easy. I think we made a lot of strides at the Bike Coalition. And I think the board of the Bike Coalition, some members of the board also explicitly said after I left that they didn't want to hire another queer woman of color because there had been too much talk about race. And I think that's what's hard about some of this work that sometimes you feel like you make two steps forward and then four steps back, but you have to keep pushing. And, and you know, the last thing I'll say is that, you know, I had that, that Schitt's Creek slide, partially because my wife is Canadian and she would kill me if I didn't, but also because when people are like, we're not interested in that option, I think we have to realize we're getting to a place where that is going to be the only option. And places like Houston, like, we all know that to do any kind of work, the only option is to make materials bilingual. Like that's just where we are now, right? That there are Spanish speakers and you have to do this. And I think we're getting to that place with talking about race. People may want to fight it, but at some point I'm not here to convince you because you're just going to become obsolete because I think we're getting to this place where folks are acknowledging that it's essential. The next question comes from Amanda Tim, and she asks, which cities and places or which universities are doing the best work to increase the racial diversity of the planning profession, and what tactics are they using? I mean, I think the, the hard part of that answer is, like, no one's doing great, right? And, and no one's doing great because a lot of people are still seeing it as a zero-sum game where there are still institutions and organizations who say, well, we want more diversity and we want more equity, but I don't want to have to, like, I don't want to have to give up my power or relinquish my power to do it. Um, with that being said, I think we've seen some, you know, 
um, not just talking about transportation, but just talking about race generally. I think Minneapolis is, is, is really trying post George Floyd, I think for obvious reasons, um, but they've had some really interesting conversations around budgeting and policing. Um, I think a lot of the cities in the Bay Area, San Francisco just announced that, you know, they're not gonna have police um, showing up um, for many calls. I think here in LA, um, Salida Reynolds, who runs our Department of Transportation, um, she has a very diverse leadership team and the city is also talking about taking traffic enforcement out of the police department. I think a lot of people like to say Oakland um, and Seattle are leaders and a lot of those places are on the West Coast. Um, but I think there's also a lot of um, interesting stuff happening in the South. Atlanta's new Department of Transportation was really trying to work more with community-based organizations. Um, there's some interesting stuff happening in Charleston, South Carolina. Um, as far as what, what methods they're using, I think, I think a lot of folks are at the very beginning stages of this work where frankly, a lot of it is talking and listening um, and a lot of, a lot of um, engagement with communities just to kind of understand the landscape. But I would say that the folks who are most successful are working with community-based organizations and figuring out how to pay these folks, treating them as the experts that they are. Okay, we have a, only a few minutes left and we have lots of questions. I will, uh, I'm just gonna um, ask the questions from now on and let you answer them and I'll do them in the order of popularity. Uh, any advice on challenging the systemic and institutional inertia in transportation from the pipeline of harmful projects still being pushed through to the legislative policymaking process that sticks to a schedule regardless of where communities are at on an issue? Yeah, I think this is, I think this is so, so tough. And I, I often give answers to this in two ways. For the folks who aren't part of a press groups, we just need you to do more. We simply need you to do more because you are in positions of power. You are part of that inertia. And so we need you to do something different. And then I think for folks who are in oppressed groups, like this is gonna be a long fight. And so I need you to not burn yourself out and to have some grace with yourself that this is not all your work. And I think what we're seeing in this space is there are kind of different levels of folks, right? I think there's this new up and coming generation, which is so exciting and they're ready to flip the table. They're like, I don't want to seat at the table. I just want to flip the table. I think there's this kind of middle generation of folks who are like, but I just got to the table. And so I don't wanna completely flip it because I'm making some changes from within. And then I think there's this older generation that is trying to feel validated and saying, well, I just invited those new people to the table. I just, I just hired that professor of color. I just made that person of color a tenured faculty member, but they still don't wanna get away from the table, right? They're still like, but look at all the good things I've done. And what I would say is like, those folks that are ready to flip the table and say, I don't even care about this table. Like this isn't where I'm trying to be. I think they're coming. And so I think that for the folks who are just comfortable sitting at the table, we need you to do more because folks of color didn't create racism. And so we, I'm not gonna say we can't change it because I would never count out folks of color to create the change we wanna see, but for it to be, um, very sustainable and for it to happen at the pace in which it needs to happen given the urgency in our country, I would simply say to get over that inertia, like white folks, we need you to look in the mirror and we need you to do more. Okay, um, what role can car ownership and car sharing play in achieving equity in transportation? So I think we first have to get out of the space of like all cars are bad. And I think this was something that we talked a lot about when I was a bicycle advocate. It can't be cars versus bikes um, because we have to acknowledge the, the car ownership um, and how that is rooted in our country of like, that was a, a, a version of success and status. And that if you're black and you walk into a job interview and you've just gotten off the bus, you still have this feeling that people aren't gonna respect you as much as if you drove up in a nice car. And so I think we first have to acknowledge that there are other parts of car ownership that are tied to the longer conversation. And only when we get to the roots of those conversations, will we be able to tackle some of the equity conversations. So talking about, yes, capitalism and status, but also talking about if folks of color are getting pushed further out into the suburbs and away from transit, they have to have cars. And so unless we're able to talk about the intersections of transportation and these other societal and planning issues, we're not going to be able to do that work. And so that's what we have to do for car ownership. 
Uh, and here's a question for people who are managers. This kind of goes to that middle level. I think you were talking about before for people who are managers and leaders within organizations, how can we reward or find ways to encourage accomplices through performance reviews or evaluations? I think people underestimate saying things to people like literally it's how do you engage with people how do you celebrate people celebration is underrated by managers it's really really underrated and I think sometimes there's this narrative well oh, millennials want promotions and raises every two seconds but I think people underestimate what it would mean to celebrate folks and to give folks opportunity and access and so I think, yes, you should write it in performance reviews, but there is also a level of mentorship and engagement and access to opportunities that have been part of this kind of good old boy network that we don't realize. And I think that should be given to folks. And frankly, not taking credit for the work that your junior level staff of color is doing and acknowledging that they're often pulling an extra shift and doing extra labor. Uh, we're just about out of time. Uh, I, I wanted to throw out one of the most provocative statements here, and this is not the only comment like this on this list, but one person said, unfortunately, I can't think of five people that I genuinely trust in my current professional circle. Um, uh, uh, how do you build those? Uh, 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 so I guess the question, I would paraphrase the question as being, um, how do you build uh, uh, those uh, 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 that, that, that level of trust across uh, the traditional boundaries so that in fact, your, your, your uh, circle of trust is much bigger and more diverse? So I think the first thing is professional environments are white centered spaces. They just are like our norms of what is professional and not professional is from a very white ideal. And that ideal often includes separating your personal life from your professional life. There are just things we don't talk about at work. And I think what folks have to realize is for those folks who are part of a, oppressed groups, they can't do that. They, like, they can't separate. If, if you are in a wheelchair, you don't stop being in a wheelchair just because you're at work. If you are Black and racism is real, that doesn't stop because you're on a bike or on a train or in a C-suite office, right? And so I think the first way to build trust is acknowledging that some of these personal and professional lines, we have to start merging them. The ability to separate them is a privilege that too many of us don't have. And I always like to say that that ability to separate is a white people thing. So first I think we have to start realizing that we can't just say, well, in my personal life, I'm reading this book. In my personal life, I've donated to this organization. We have to start saying, I'm reading this book I'm exposing myself to other types of media. I'm trying to expand my friend circle. I'm trying to do all those things, but it's not just for my personal Thursday night book club. I want to take these lessons and convert them into my work life. And I think that is the first step of building trust. And the last part of that is one of the main ways we separate is from not being vulnerable in professional spaces. And again, as members of oppressed groups, we always have to be vulnerable because in order to ask for the help we need, we have to reveal some of ourselves. And so I think that's the other way. You're going to be able to build more trust if you are yourselves willing to be more vulnerable. And that's a huge part of this. This work I do isn't for fame and glory and money. It's because I care. And a lot of this comes from a place of love, not from a place of like, ah, oh, you people have done something wrong. And so I think that love and empathy is something we all need to bring to our professional spaces. Okay, Tamika Butler, thank you very much for uh, joining us today. We, we had a huge crowd and it was a very powerful. And as I said, from all the questions, we had some very, uh, very exceptional comments of people who, who, who feel power as a, result of, uh, as a result of our talk today. Um, for those of you in the audience, I wanna remind you that our next uh, Kinder Institute online event will be February 17th when Angie Schmidt uh, kicks off our 2021 Urban Read series with a discussion of her new book, Right of Way, Race, Class, and the Silent Epidemic of Pedestrian Deaths in America. You can register for our upcoming webinars by, by visiting kinder.rice.edu or by scanning the QR code on the screen. So again, Tamika, thank you very much. Sorry we didn't get to all the questions. There's millions of them there. Um, uh, I, I, I hope, uh, feel free to follow up uh, and, and thanks again for being with us today. Thank you.